Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis, to the Praise of Folly podcast. I am interviewing Alexei Bash, and he's a Russian expatriate. Uh, and so my first question is, what was it like growing up in Russia? Well, I, I was born in 1987, which uh, is when the, uh, the Soviet Union was still, was still in business. I don't really have any memories of the Soviet Union. I was just a kid. However, my first memory was around when I was three or so. I recall seeing the red flags coming down. And when I got a little bit older, I want to say I was five or six, early 1990s, I got the sense that there was a pervasive uh, social climate of unease, profound anxiety about the seismic changes that were taking place. Uh, we were living through a rather unprecedented time in the 90s. For example, the streets were obviously unsafe. Uh, the economy collapsed. To give you a clear example of that, in the 19, 1987, when I was just born, uh, the USSR had the, the GDP per capita of approximately $9,000, which was more or less on par with a fairly well-off uh, South American country, such as, say, Argentina or Chile. Nothing, nothing to write home about, nothing to brag about, but it was tolerable. People lived with a modicum of dignity. However, when Boris Yeltsin got done with Russia in the 90s, and then th those are the years of my childhood, the GDP per capita has fallen to $1,330. To give you a sense of perspective of what that means, consider how it was on par with Egypt. And Morocco was a little higher, 1,400. The United States was at 35,000. Germany was at 26,000. And Spain was at 15,000. So in other words, we went from a fairly decent uh, standard of living with some scarcities, with, uh, with limited growth, to uh, African-style poverty in uh, 10 years and that's the story of my childhood take that as you may what are your thoughts on the ussr looking back well the you that's a really loaded and a fascinating question but let me tell you something there is a number of misconceptions about the ussr in the west well number one is that lenin was a an idealist an intention a well-intentioned benefactor of the people. That is absolute nonsense, and I'll get into more detail later on. The other I, I misconception is that Russia had a revolution. That is incorrect. There, there, there was no Russian revolution. There was a coup d'etat, and I'll get into that later. The third is that Lenin is a landmark figure in Russian history who single-handedly, through the force of will, shaped the, the revolution. That's absolute nonsense. Uh, historians in, have a theory uh, uh, known as the theory to describe major events known as the great man theory. And this is an example of how such a theory is fallacious. Lenin did not create the revolution on his own. Okay, let me start from the beginning. What, Lenin was not an idealist. Lenin was a savage in the strictest sense of the word. Yes, there is a statue of Lenin, in Seattle that has not been torn down. I mean, it's all the insanity that's going on in your country. But these useful idiots who put flowers at his feet would have been shot in Lenin's times. Lenin regarded them as nothing more than useful idiots. Now, to explain what I mean, when Lenin was vying for political power, he openly advocated for terrorism. Lenin never thought twice about shooting, shooting innocent people to make a political point. That's the definition of terrorism. Uh, when, when he was running for, when, when he was trying to get votes in a, in a political establishment, he famously screamed, all the power to the Bolsheviks. To most Westerners, it, it seems like a very banal, very typical rallying cry, almost cliche. But if you know the Russian language, the situation becomes clearer. The word Bolshe means more. So Lenin understood his party to be a majoritarian party. And he perceived his enemies as the party of the minority. Menshe means less. So the Bolsheviks 
versus the Mensheviks, the, the majoritarians versus the elites versus the yada yada yada, the white the white army, the corrupt czars, their 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 boyars, their nobles. Anyhow, Lenin was not a majoritarian. Lenin, at every possible opportunity, quashed every voice of reason that called for democracy, to public your or anything that benefited the people. Consider the case of Kronstadt sailors. The Kronstadt sailors, your, your naval establishment, who held Soviets, and, and uh, most Westerners don't know what a Soviet is. The Soviet Union bastardized Soviet, the Soviet. Soviet in the Russian language means Soviet. Soviet uh, uh, advice. It, it, it was a committee. It was a committee where people gathered to discuss political issues, and they were the intention of coming to a democratic consensus. That's what the Soviets were about. That's what the sailors of Kronstadt believed in. Lenin did not believe in that. He had them exterminated. And it, while Lenin famously wrote a letter to his colleagues denouncing Stalin for his irresponsibility, bloodthirst, and savagery, uh, Lenin had absolutely no qualms about using Lenin Stalin's services uh, as a, what shall we call, a professional burglar. Stalin fashioned himself a professional revolutionary, much like the playboy Carlos uh, Ilyich Ramirez, a jackal from Venezuela. He, Stalin was a terrorist, he robbed banks, and he raised money for the revolution that way. So Lenin just uh, used Stalin, and then he intended to discard him, because he realized that Stalin was too much of a barbarian. Who's, who could not be controlled. That's all there was to it, or anyhow. So that's point one about how Lenin was not an idealist. Point two, there was no revolution. There was a coup d'etat. Revolution implies there was a change of social order. There, there is a, a change in, in the structure of power. That did not happen. Far from desiring to abolish the Tsarist aristocracy, Lenin simply usurped their power. Lenin at the core had absolutely no problem with the fact that with the czars, 90% of the citizenry were serfs uh, who were living on starvation wages. Lenin had no interest in changing that whatsoever. So he seized power, not as a Bolshevik, not as a majoritarian, but as an actual Menshevik, as a minority leader who seized power by violent means, and in so doing, he crushed every voice for democracy, liberty, and common sense, like the sailors of Kronstadt. Well, and the revolution did not, the revolution, the so-called revolution, did not happen overnight. Now, not, not even a little bit. If, if you look, if you read the writings of Fyodor Dostoevsky, you will understand that. Uh, and what one of the one of his most famous books is Brothers Karam Karamazov. Uh, and uh, the last name Karamazov is, isn't something he invented. It was based on a Karamazin, a famous Russian terrorist who was ex who was uh, about to be executed by the Tsar. In, fa in fact, there is a famous case in the community of Russian anarchists of Ivan Kalyaev, who assassinated Duke Sergei. And uh, Kalyaev has been regarded as a hero of the Russian left because he targeted a corrupt nobleman rather than ordinary people. Dostoevsky despised the left. He despised the, intellect the, 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 the pretentious intellectuals, uh, and he, he exposed them in his novels. For example, in The Possessed, we have a young, idealistic, naive man, Raskolnikov. And by the way, the word Raskol in the, in the Russian language means deception, trickery, cunning, or manipulation. So Raskolnikov, basically his last name says that he's a dishonest man. He may, may, it's not clear if he's deceiving himself or he's deceiving others. But clearly, the way he lived his life showed that he was not a man of integrity. He committed the murder because he believed himself to be above moral law. He, he believed tradition, social values, and public attitudes of good and evil are completely meaningless. And Dostoevsky revisits the same theme in The Possessed, where one of the main characters 
as a distinguished prof professor at the university who clearly suffers from delusions of grandeur. He, his arrogance is overweening and palpable. Eventually, this professor and his cohort become possessed by an, incre an incredibly stupid idea. Which, which is why they, they, they then began advocating for revolutionary terror. And of course, in the process, they consume an ungodly amount of alcohol. And for, and for good measure, one of these intellectuals rapes a 13-year-old girl. Now, Dostoevsky had that in the original draft, but it has been cut out later because the book was censored. So anyways, to recap, three, three misconceptions about the Soviet Union. One... Lenin is not an idealist. If any statue in America needs to be torn down, it's the statue of Lenin in Seattle. Two, there was no revolution. It was a coup d'etat. It, it was a, it was not a Bolshevik or majoritarian uprising. It was it was the opposite. And thirdly, there has been a long-standing tradition of far-left anarchist terrorism in Russia long before Lenin was born. All right. Um I know you have some popular thoughts on this, but what are your thoughts on Boris Yeltsin, who's generally considered the least popular 20th century Russian leader? Well, you see, Yeltsin is one of the most misunderstood politicians in Russia and in, in all of Europe, pretty much, I would say. One important thing to know about Boris Yeltsin is that he, uh, he, his descendants, his, I'm sorry, his, his, his ancestors, your, uh, your kulaks, Kulak, your kulak means fist. So they were combative, wealthy farmers who were kind of the, the, the Russian rough riders. Maybe, maybe you can even call them the Russian equivalent of the rednecks. Uh, they had a libertarian streak. They believed in private property. They cherished the values of personal freedom and independence. So Yeltsin very much felt at home with a traditional conservative, if not a libertarian, point of view in the, in the U.S. Yeltsin was an admirer of the United States, which is why he visited very often. If you dig around, you're going to find uh, videos or at least pictures of Boris Yeltsin uh, running up and down the street of Washington, Washington D.C. because he was uh, inebriated out of his mind. Uh, Yeltsin believed in freedom. He, he was a drunkard. He, he was weak in character. And, but, but he, deep down in his heart, wanted Russia to be free. And, that, and that's why his bid for presidency was like a breath of fresh air in, in, the, in the hearts and minds of people who were, frankly, fed up with decades of communist totalitarian ideology. Though, one, though Yeltsin, being a liberal in the Russian sense, would have been well advised to study Dostoevsky. Had he read Russia, Karma is that he would have found the story of the Grand Inquisitor. And the Grand Inquisitor is a story in, in Brothers Karmazov that's written by one of the characters, Ivan Karmazov, who was a, a, an atheist skeptic, intellectual, whom Dostoevsky critiqued. And Ivan Karma, Karamazov wrote a plot where uh, Jesus Christ comes back to earth, where a resurrection happens, and the judgment day is around the corner. So he descends upon Sevilla in Spain, when, when he is then immediately apprehended by a religious patriarch who threatens to burn him like the wildest of heretics. Th then the Grand Inquisitor lectures Jesus on how people don't really want to be free. They don't want to think for themselves. They just want to receive bread and butter. They just want to be fed. Make us our slaves, they scream. The Grand Inquisitor thought, make us our slaves, but feed us. Is, is, is how Grand Inquisitor saw the issue, that there was a paradox of freedom in the sense that uh, people, in order to be free, the people need to take responsibility for their, for their own outcomes. And clearly with Yeltsin, the Russian citizenry wasn't ready for that, not even close. And uh, that, that is why he simply came far ahead of his time. He got an understanding and the national character of the citizenry. He his his idea, his idea of what have you that Russia can be like the U.S. has been completely misapplied. He frankly had no idea what he was doing. What do you think of Vladimir Putin and well, the idea that he's a neo-czar? Well, uh, see, Putin 
learn from Yeltsin's mistakes. Putin uh, obviously saw what I obviously knew about the Grand Inquisitor. I don't know how long ago he read the book, but he understood the concept. He made it, he made slaves out of the public. He, he enslaved them, but he fed them. So the GDP is 10 times as high as it was with Yeltsin, but there is no freedom. Zero. Uh, to, to show you what I mean, I, uh, P Putin reserves the right to incarcerate anybody whom he sees as a political threat. Personality cult is everywhere. The cult of his personality is pervasive. Uh, uh, for example, if you have an unorthodox opinion about the coronavirus, as so many uh, radicals in America do, Putin can have can have you put in prison for that. So uh, apparently, disseminating propaganda or misleading information about the coronavirus or anything else on that, on that matter is a crime in Putin's Russia. What do you think are the historic problems and difficulties that hamper Russia? Well, uh, to really understand the essence of these historic problems and difficulties, you've got to understand that Russia has been occupied by Genghis Khan and the Mongols for three centuries. Ivan the Terrible liberated Russia, where he set a powerful precedent. He set a powerful precedent that if a political leader unifies the country, if he feeds the masses, he gets to be the Grand Inquisitor. Liberty is at, at the bottom of, of the totem pole of values. Uh, the, the Russian collective mentality is profoundly slavish, and, and that's not going to change anytime soon. What are your thoughts on the current situation in the United States? <laughs> well, the best advice I can give you is read The Possessed by Fyodor Dostoevsky and read Crime and Punishment. <laughs> What's going on here is that the, the, the radical left, the revolutionary terrorist point of view is endorsed by a tiny minority of the citizenry well 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 however they wish to impose that position on everybody else the due process of law does not matter anymore apparently they don't care if statues are torn down by by hooligans they don't understand that the this is a decision that must be made by the community as a whole they see no problem with the fact that abraham lincoln is being branded a racist, although he freed the slaves. In fact, I remember this day as clearly as daylight. In 2007, I have been naturalized as a U.S. citizen, and I, I had to I had to pass a basic history test with one with one of the questions being, uh, "Who was Abraham Lincoln?" And the correct answer was he freed the slaves. Yet. Uh, the possessed of America, who are in the, in the Democratic Party, who are in the mainstream media, who are in the entertainment circus, and who are the highest nationals of the university, simply have no idea of what's happening here. They, they do not understand that they have lost their minds and that they, they're eroding the foundation of a civilized society. This has been said and done before. And of course, they they are they would never dare to learn from the history of Russia. My gosh, Russia was a communist state. Uh, Jean Paul Sartre famously said that said two things actually. First thing he said is that Stalin's crimes should not be exhumed, should not be exposed, because to do so would mean to discourage the proletariat and to dampen their resolve. And the second thing Sartre said is that propaganda by the deed. Is a good thing. Jean Paul Sartre was a staunch admirer of Carlos the Jackal from Venezuela, who was a well known communist terrorist. So Jean Paul Sartre advocated bomb in the 1980s Olympic Games. This is an example of the possessed in action. If that's not what the possessed look like today, I don't know what is. This wave of insanity must be stopped. Yeah, we have a question from the audience. Uh, can you see the question here, Alex? Ah, yeah, yep, I see it. Can you talk about the role of the United States in the 1996 Russian election? 
Well, to be completely honest with you, uh, my understanding of that issue is rather limited. However, I do know that the Clinton administration has indeed been involved uh, in the Yeltsin campaign. The Clinton administration provided funding, provided intelligence in the form of advisors, and they have sent their neoliberal cronies to Russia to make sure that the economy continues to be plundered by the, by the oligarchs and, and their allies in the West. I can't tell you specifically who was involved, how much money was spent, but it is a well-known fact that Yeltsin has been supported by Bill Clinton. If you, if you Google, if you just look it up, uh, Yeltsin and Clinton, you're going to see a speech that they're given together where Clinton speaks like a human being, a dignified individual. Yeltsin is obviously drunk out of his mind and starts spouting nonsense. I think he said something like, oh, you're all a disaster. And in a firm authoritative tone. And then Bill Clinton almost dies laughing, pats him on the shoulder and says, ah, I hope you translated that right. Well, that sums, sums just about sums it up. That is the nature of the circus that was in town. Draw your own conclusions. If you want to know what, what exactly the role of Bill of the Clinton administration was in the Russian election, you, you can dig around. I don't know if you're going to find anything really interesting, but you can only imagine what kind of conversations they had behind closed doors. This is actually a nice segue to the next question. What are your thoughts on uh, 21st century U.S.-Russian relations? Well, I really don't think we're going to see an alliance between the, the neoliberals of Russia and the neoliberals of America. Both are going to be consigned to the to the ash heap of heap of history, as Trotsky used to say. The neoliberals are on their way out. Let's just be honest here. That uh, their anti-capitalistic mentality is declining as it was on the rise, and neo-communism was also on the rise. So you're not going to see a neoliberal president, even if Joe Biden wins, and you're not going to see neoliberalism in Russia. What's uh, we're seeing a resurgence of the Cold War tensions. Now, Donald Trump may be a little softer on Russia than the Democrats. Make no mistake about it, both countries want to reclaim their, for, their former glory. Both countries want to emerge as the hegemon, and these tensions will continue to escalate. I, I, would, I would imagine that Russia will collude with China to do all sorts of unseemly things, and there are rumors going around that Russia is paying Islamic radicals to murder uh, American soldiers. I don't know if it's true, but I would not be surprised. I really would not anticipate any kind of a truce between Russia and the U.S. in the near future. And by the way, Ru Russia ranks has ranked in the top 10 over the last 30 years among nations with the most anti-American attitudes. If you want to, if you want to make a wonderful le living. As a comedian in Russia, you just have to repeat the mantra of how stupid Americans are. That's what sells. If you want to, if you want to be a popular TV personality, you just bash on the stupidity of Americans every chance you can possibly get, and then, then you can comment on any political issue under the sun. As long as you're bashing Americans, any kind of a historical error or a logical fallacy or anything that you're doing wrong will be forgiven. I promise you that. Reminds me of an old Soviet joke where an American went to Moscow and said, we have free speech in America, we can shout down with Reagan. And the Russians said, we have free speech too in Russia, we can shout down with Reagan too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on Alexander Dugan and Duganism? Well, honestly, Dugan, the less sad, the better. I count me completely unimpressed. Uh, Dugan reminds me of, uh, of Hegel, how he was the philosopher of the Prussian state who was in charge of developing a, a, an ideology elevating the geopolitical status of the Prussian state. And Karl Popper exposed Hegel in, uh, in the Open Society and its enemies, Volume 2. To be fair, Hegel did applaud Napoleon for bringing the enlightened French thought to Prussia. But all in all, uh, Hegel was nothing more than a lackey and a handmaiden of uh, the Prussian state. Dugan, well, what, what can we say about Dugan? He once uh, famously released a statement saying that Putin has no opposition, no real opponents. 
uh, Putin is everywhere, so therefore anyone who seriously opposes him belongs in a lunatic asylum. Uh, that comment, however, won the second place prize for flattery on Russian national TV. What more can we say about Dugin? Uh, Keith, do you have any questions for Alex? Yeah, um, as far as the Russian Revolution or the uh, Lenin's coup, um, one thing that I think is interesting about that is on, on some extreme left wing thinking, like really far left Marxists that are you know to the left of, of Bolshevism or some far left anarchist thinking, there's this view that the um, the Russian Revolution was actually a kind of bourgeois revolution uh, comparable to, say, the French Revolution or the American Revolution. Uh, or even perhaps the Cromwell Revolution uh, in uh, 16, whatever it was. And because the, the the common theme in all of those revolutions is that what you see happening is that you see that the people who are actually making revolution are not poor people or peasants or workers mm -hmm. or any of that stuff. It's always people from the upper class or mm -hmm. the upper middle class who are educated, but mm -hmm. they see their political ambitions being frustrated. For example, mm -hmm. in the... Uh, you know, in the Cromwellian Revolution, you had this uh, Puritan culture that was uh, rejected the authority of the Anglican Church, and that melded with the growing uh, merchant culture of the time. Uh, and then in the American Revolution, that was sort of like the, the you know the American founders were largely what the Europeans would have considered middle class people, that is, landowners and merchants and bankers, but they they weren't titled, so they weren't part of the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. They were more like the middle class. And that same sector seems to be what uh, drove the French Revolution as well. Mm -hmm. It was more extreme because while the American revolutionaries were motivated by Locke and Hobbes and Montesquieu and thinkers like that, the French revolutionaries tended to be driven by the ideas of, say, Rousseau and some of the more extreme philosophes and some of those. Mm -hmm. And then when you get you know over 100 years later to Russia, it seems to be a repeat of the same thing. If you look mm -hmm. at who the leaders of the Russian Revolution were, they were all lawyers and professors and right. Academics and you know artists and writers and that kind of stuff. I mean, ironically, the only one of them that was you know comparable to being an actual proletarian was Stalin. He was just a, a criminal, you know. But uh, but he came from a peasant background, I think, and it was a you know a, a priest who had been defrocked or something. Or I think no, I think he'd gone to seminary and they decided they didn't want him around and kicked him out for <laughs> good reason. But uh, yeah, so so and, and you see that pattern, that same pattern with the communist revolution. Mm -hmm. 20th century. If you look at, you know, the Chinese Revolution, it's Mao Zedong. He's a school teacher. He's not a peasant, you know. And if you look at uh, Pol Pot, same thing, a school teacher. <laughs> Kim Il Sung, you know, the founder of the North Korean state, he had spent most of his life in Russia as a personal friend of Joseph Stalin. He barely even knew the Korean language. He didn't even speak Korean properly. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, he was he was essentially a you know a, a Russian, you know, who just happened to be <laughs> racially uh, or ethnically a Korean. Uh, and, and and you see that uh, Fidel Castro, he was a lawyer, you know, so you, you see this same uh, pattern being played out over and over and over again. Every one of these hard left revolutions going back for centuries, it's always the same class of people. It's always <laughs> this kind of left wing of the middle class who feels alienated from the existing system for whatever reason. And you see that happening now in the United States, like you pointed out that the, the, the PC class is less than 5% of the population based mm -hmm. on the actual research data that's been done. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all concentrated in these ideas industries that tend to be dominated mm -hmm. by what is now the upper middle class. It's the, you know, the universities and the, and the entertainment industry and public relations and human resources. And that kind of stuff. So it's the same class of people that made these earlier revolutions. You know, it's a, it's a revolution by the bourgeoisie against the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. Well, I must say, I, I have nothing to really add to that point. I cannot think of a single revolution that was actually carried out by the underclass. What, what we see here is what Dostoevsky anticipated and possessed revolution as a result of uh, a small number of elites, or at least upper middle class uh, rabble rousers being possessed by a particularly stupid idea. In fact, uh, Brian Kaplan, a modern economist from George Mason University, uh, said it best. 
a revolution is as romantic as drunk driving on the playground. Now let's drill that idea into the skulls of the tech oligarchy in the United States. Let's have them read the possessed repeatedly until they learn the point, until they learn their lesson. Nothing good ever came of a revolution, period. There ha however, there have been fascist dictatorships. They're actually reactionary. But the reason, the reason why they're not as harmful is that fascists are conservative. They believe in, in preserving tradition, order, and hierarchy. They're not going to uproot society in entirety. So once they're, they die or once they're removed, fascism can be undone. Fascism still preserves the foundation of society intact. However, when you have a... When you have an actual revolution, what you see is quite similar to what happens in a cult when a new when a new inductee arrives and he receives uh, and he, he receives what's known as the ego cleansing. Uh, finally enough, when I was a university student, I was approached by the political cult of Lyndon B. LaRouche, who died recently. I believe he he lived not so far from you, Keith. Uh, was it Leesburg, Virginia, or Lynchburg? I don't remember where he's yeah, from exactly. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I spent a few hours with them. I saw right through them. But what they do believe in is, uh, is ego stripping. And uh, what happens there is that when a person joins the cult, they need to be demeaned, demoralized, and separated. From the from their foundation, from their life as they knew it, which and then they can be turned into anything. They can possibly be turned to, to a lesser extent. Uh, that may happen in a conservative institution like the military, but I don't know if they're quite as extreme as the cult. Well, uh, as far as fascism is concerned, I'm, I'm not going to come out in defense of fascism. That's why I'm not in favor of Putin or his lapdog alexander dugan whose name is actually better left than mention i'm not even going to say his name anymore however fascism is just not as destructive look at look at spain for the franco dictatorship they had concentration camps they had extrajudicial executions they had total tyranny you could be arrested for uh, for having a a sexual relationship outside of marriage, all of that is terrible. But now Spain is a thriving democracy. Look at Portugal with Antonio Salazar. Similar Catholic, far-right, authoritarian, quasi-fascist, if not a completely fascist, totalitarian regime. But countries live through that. Uh, and then how about the Pinochet uh, in Chile? Chile is actually one or one of the most... Uh, accomplished economies in South America. It may not be an ideal place to live, but I'll tell you something. There are plenty of people from Argentina going to Chile to, to live and work there, and not the other way around. There are plenty of people who want to go to Chile from Peru or Colombia. Uh, so Chile has a fascist past. Other countries have more of a communist past. The results are, are, are obvious. Nobody but, the, but a possessed ideologue from the PC upper class in the U.S. could possibly deny that. What to, to what extent, if any, do you think that the Eastern Orthodox religion had a role to play in Russia's servile consciousness? Well, uh, what I would highly recommend you do and find an answer to this question is Google Hofstadt's cultural dimensions. It's a spectrum that evaluates cultures across six different attributes. For example, there is individualism, power, distance, uncertainty, avoidance, masculinity, indulgence, and long-term orientation. What you see is a similarity between the Russian cultures, or broadly speaking, the cultures that were influenced by the Orthodox Church and the Catholic cultures is that they both score highly on two things, in two dimensions. One, they score highly on uncertainty avoidance, which means they are used to, to having a to be in control. They are used to having a complicated bureaucracy and, and an extensive laundry list of rules to live by. 
And uh, the other, the other dimension that they score very highly on is the power distance, which is much more salient. Uh, uh, Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox Church, and the Catholic Church, have been known to have a much more rigid hierarchy and a power structure than their Protestant counterparts. I suppose the difference becomes the most palpable in light of a comparison between Ireland and England. Uh, well. Uh, so the, the, the Orthodox Church certainly had an influence, to be sure. And I would say it has been an influence toward authoritarianism, authoritarianism, though I would even go farther than that and say that the Orthodox Church has been more authoritarian than the Catholic Church. It's a fairly little-known fact that Moscow is known as the Third Rome, and the doctrine of the Third Rome has been salient in the history of the Tsarist Russia. The first Rome being Rome itself, of course, then the Constantinople, and then Moscow. Now, the doctrine of the Third Rome basically posits that the Tsar is God's, dire God's direct representative on Earth. Uh, so he, the, the throne of the Tsar has been sanctified. Lenin inherited the sanctity of the Russian state, uh, Putin, however, tried to revitalize the sanctity. Ye Yeltsin bastardizes, Yeltsin vulgarized the office, the sacred office of presidency by, by being absolutely smashed half the time. On one occasion, he, or he jumped off the airplane, he, he ran out or ran down the stairs, waving with both hands in the air, ear to ear, smile, face red, clearly drunk out of his mind, and he arrives to a hero's welcome, where a symphony is performing. So he pushes the, the orchestrator out of the way, grabs his stick, and begins orchestrating the, the symphony on his own. So Putin and his supporters uh, despise Yeltsin for the fact that he vulgarized the office of presidency. Uh, the, uh, the roots of the, of, the, of, the, of the Third Rome are profound. And they cannot be altered. This is the basis of Putin's legitimacy. It may be unthinkable from the Western point of view, but Putin is popular because he he brought honor back to the to the sanctity of the throne, uh, and he uh, he is implementing the doctrine of the Third Rome by restoring the expansionary and imperialistic ambitions of Russia. Hmm. Now the the great debate. Uh, who is the better author, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky? To be honest, uh, I'm a little biased because I've read so much more Dostoevsky. Uh, well, my understanding of Tolstoy is somewhat limited, but I like Dostoevsky better. For the most part, Dostoevsky was a, was a writer with, with a very perspicacious and a keen insight into psychology. He... he he, he had a profound understanding of the mob mentality. This is why his book, The Possessed, needs to be mandatory reading across college campuses in America. Throw Leslie Feinberg and the, the rainbow tribute to Cuba to the trash. Commit that to the ash heaps of history. Commit it to the flames, as David Hume used to say. Push the PC ideology out of the way and make Dostoevsky mandatory reading. That that is how that is the matter of survival for the entire and the entire Western civilization, perhaps. Because if the if Dostoevsky's lesson is not going to be learned, the the entire Western civilization may collapse. Imagine the profundity of the economic impact of the collapse of the dollar, the collapse of America. What exactly will happen with Europe? What will happen with Japan? So Tolstoy. The War and Peace is certainly worth reading. I haven't read it, I'll be honest with you. I've read bits and pieces, but Tolstoy is more of a sociologist. And Tolstoy had, had a mystical outlook in life. He, he was deeply spiritual. He, he, was, he was very much interested in the, in the family dynamics of the upper class, that Anna Karenina is the case in point. He, he was ashamed of his aristocratic status. And he tried to live a simpler life, but I, I would say Tolstoy, being a sociologist, had a more, had a broader critique of, of human nature and life. You can learn a lot about family dynamics, the nature of culture, how culture changes, the nature of personal relationships. 
you can learn a lot of interesting facts about that era and human behavior and, and, and as a matter of human nature. But if you really want to have a deep understanding of the core drives and the core instincts in human nature, Dostoevsky is what you want to read. So who's better it depends on what you're interested in. If you're looking from the standpoint of behavior, beha behavioral sociology, Tolstoy is a better choice for you. But if you're interested in human nature, read Dostoevsky. Uh, Keith, do you have any question for Alex? Yeah. Um, one thing that I think is interesting is the way that um, in the West now, or at least in the United States, you, there's this Putin fan club that's developed on the, on the <laughs> cultural fringes. Now, uh -huh. in, in one hand, we see this constant, uh, you know, I guess we could call it Russophobia or whatever, being promoted in the media, you know, like the, like the, uh, the idea that Putin is like the this over evil overlord that's like pulling the world strings, you know, like the, like the lizard people and David Icke's conspiracy theory or something. But we've, got the, we've also got though on the fringes of political culture in the United States on the far left and on the far right, we've got a Putin cult. Like some of the, 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 uh, the actual American Marxist Leninists are actually fans of Putin. Um, and it, because they see him as a revival of Russian communism or something like that. Uh, and then you have on the far right, ironically, you see the same thing. You have these, uh, uh, you know, alt-right or you know, self-styled neo-fascists. Mm -hmm. They see Russia as the white man's savior because it's a pre predominantly white country, or, or they see uh, Putin as, as some idealized, uh, you know, patriarch. Or, uh, and in fact, there's this trend now on the far right where you see all these people that have no cultural roots in Eastern Orthodoxy whatsoever. You know, they're, if they ever if they grew up with any religion at all, it was American style Episcopalianism, like upper class Episcopalianism or something. Uh, but all of a sudden, they're now converting to Eastern Orthodoxy and embracing that as their religious tradition. <laughs> even though they know nothing about it. You know, it's it's more like it, it, for a lot of them, it's more like being in a death metal band or something, and just you know, <laughs> your hair and beard, and you know, and and you know, put up with these weird Gothic symbols, and, everything. and that's that's what it means to be Eastern Orthodox. Uh, but what do you make of that? Why Why on earth would these people be embracing Putin? I mean, my feeling about it is that it's, you know, it's it, that people, for whatever reason, people who dislike their own society often look for utopia somewhere else. They think, well, maybe it's better over there on the other side of the fence. Or whatever. And, uh, you know, and, and I think a lot of the, you know, the cult of masculinity by all these non-masculine guys uh, that's developing in this all right culture, you know, it's, you know, I mean, that whole culture is made up of young men who couldn't get a girlfriend to save their lives. And then they're out there trying to like make themselves, you know, uh, as the vanguard of the revival of Western masculinity or something. Like that. Where do you think this Putin worship is coming from? Well, it seems to me that you're touching upon a much broader problem. Authoritarianism has been on the rise. Uh, specifically authoritarian populism. It's not just about Putin. Look at Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. Look at uh, Andras Manuel Lopez Obrador in Mexico. Look at what, what have you. Hugo Chavez died not so long ago. Look at Viktor Orban in Hungary. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. And uh, this is uh, symptomatic of a loss of faith in liberal democracy. However, people tend to confuse neoliberalism, classical liberalism. That's one thing. However, the other issue I see is that there is no such thing as American culture. Let's just be honest about that. And how old is America? Well, in 1776, how many years is that? It's the 224 years. Americanism is analogous to culture as black as the color. There is no such thing. If I take you to a Japanese restaurant, there is sushi. If I take you to an Italian restaurant, there is lasagna. If I take you to what have you, a Mexican restaurant, there is tacos. What the hell is American food? Burger King? How about an American museum? If you want to create a museum in Europe representing the American culture, what are you supposed to put on there? A, a clip from Jerry Springer? What have you, uh, pictures of Bill Gates when he was young? How about how about the pictures of the statue of Lincoln being torn down? 
So this reminds me, actually, of how I used to know a lady who came from a radical Islamist family, and she declared herself a feminist when she was 15. So naturally, she got into drugs, the heavy drinking, the party culture, what have you. She was getting into lots of trouble. And suddenly, she met a man from Jordan. <laughs> she converted back to Islam. She moved to Jordan, had a child with him, and brought him back to the U.S. and got him a green card. You see, uh, the United States culture, or a lack thereof, you don't need to perform uh, ego strip, stripping. You don't need to perform any kind of a lobotomy on the American collective mentality. It's, al it's already there. It's pliable for political manipulation as it is. It's like glue or clay that can be that you can use to mold it into anything. So when you don't have a clear identity, you one day you can like pooch and the other day you can swing to the extreme left and say, and say oh, good Chavez isn't so bad. And with, with the faith and liberal democracy declining across the board, any sort of insanity is conceivable. There, 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 the, America is a fertile breeding ground for the possessed straight out of Dostoevsky. I don't know what farce uh, your two presidential candidates emerged, of, emerged out of. There was Mr. Deplorable and Mr. Dementor. I don't think Dostoevsky could have made this up. Is this out of Gabriel Garcia Marquez and his magical realism? Well, what planet are we on? This is possible only in America. For the simple reason there is no cultural foundation. There is no emphasis on tradition. There is no emphasis on, on learning. And there is no emphasis on... And what's uh, what European European conservatives consider to be noblesse obliged? If you are a person of the upper class, it's your professional and moral responsibility to be civil, to be well educated, to be competent, not to speak like an idiot. And uh, Bill Clinton, for example, gave an interview to an obnoxious journalist who pushed his way through the crowd and then asked him what color of underwear the president wears, and Bill Clinton just said blue. Could he not have just, could he not have simply said, sir, this is not the kind of a question you ask the U.S. president, and leave it at that. The, there, there, the most pervasive condition in American insanity is the lack of dignity. The culture of dignity has been replaced by the culture of victimhood. And we're all in big trouble, because if, there, if this is not absolute insanity, you tell me what, what may be. Yeah, do you have any... Follow up to that is I've had this conversation with um, Europeans before, and a lot of Europeans will tell me that uh, they say when we look at America, we don't see an offshoot of Europe. What we see is this amorphous mass of light skinned people who act like idiots. You know, we don't we don't even recognize that as America as, as demonstrably European. Like they'll talk about how, as you were saying, all the different uh, traditional uh, European nations have their own identifiable culture. And, and then they will say the same thing. When we look at, uh, I've had English people and Germans and French people mm -hmm. tell me this. They all say, when we look at America, we just see, what is that freak show? And, uh, <laughs> and the, uh, uh, interestingly though, I've had American blacks tell me this, the same thing. Um, I've, I had a, a student once, a black student, tell me, you know, you white people, you don't have any culture at all. Not yet. They're like, we have culture, we have music, we have food, we have, we have an identifiable black American culture. It may be submerged in the wider American culture, but there is an identifiable American culture. Whereas you America, you white Americans, we don't just don't get you, you know, what are you anyway? And and I think she was actually right. I think she was actually, I think she was actually right. It's, uh, you do in the United States among some of the ethnic minority groups that have been insulated somewhat from the mainstream and not allowed to integrate into the mainstream you do see an identifiable culture among, say, American blacks and uh, Native American Indians, and maybe some other groups like the Cajuns in the in the uh, mm -hmm. Deep South, and that is an identifiable culture. Or maybe the Native Hawaiians, uh, but or maybe even the Puerto Ricans. You know, all these groups that have been kept out of the mainstream culture. But one thing that I have noticed is that the more and more ethnic minority groups integrate into the the white middle class American culture. The more they just become that, you know, like I, I've uh, I've accounted a lot of that in fringe political circles as well. I've encountered a lot of people who are ethnic minorities in the sense that if you look at them, they say, OK, that's not a European descended person, but they're just standard middle class, middle American, 
you know, white people, you know, I mean, they have the same basic values or outlook or interests, and they're not different in any, in any way except appearance. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's just like the difference among Europeans among being brunette or blonde or, or redhead or something. And that's the same way with uh, culturally assimilated ethnic minorities as well. I've noticed that's an interesting pattern. Mm -hmm. I agree that such a pattern exists. And assimilation in the American sense simply means a loss of cultural foundation. Assimilation in any other country means conformity. For example, if you move to France, you need to learn the French language, you need to study the French history, you need to learn the French social mores and manners, and so on and so on. Every country has a core, core center of values. In the US, it's hard to say what exactly that may be. And this is why there's so much uh, polar, pol polarization on, on the fringe ends. People are desperate for meaning. At a time of national crisis, they demand clarity, order, and log logical consistency in the sense of who they are, what their country is about, and where, where they need to move forward. They are completely lost in every sense of the earth. One thing I'd like to add to this, conver to this particular phase of the conversation is that I think it would be correct to say, more correct to say that America has an anti-culture now, because mm -hmm. if you look at everything before 1960, there were two broad cultural phases in America. There was the antebellum period from, the, from independence until the Civil War, and then the sort of Yankee wasp period from the Civil War until 1960. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're seeing now is since 1960, uh, there, there hasn't been a coherent new culture to reassert itself over America. And the closest thing we have is, is these uh, woke, possessed terrorists. <laughs> I would agree with that, though I have to ask you, why do you think that may be? Well, you may tell me it's, it's probably because of uh, the rising tide of individualism in the 60s. Maybe it's because of the parallel trend of corporate oligopolies, the, the era of globalization. And it's assault on the on culture, tradition, and the individual fallouts. See, this is the paradox of American individualism. The, in, in the language of a famous sociologist, David Reisman, Americans have been other directed people by, since the 1950s, a little before the 60s. You see that trend actually started in the 40s and 50s. It just accelerated in the 60s. The other directed person is pleasant, eager to please, flexible, would say he's an individual. He's not. He's not going to be rigid about his religious views, or maybe because he doesn't care. He, may, however, he will latch on any possible bandwagon out there to to, to fit in to, to prove how other directed he is, how flexible of a person he is, and this is the 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 key to success in the American media. It seems to be as much as flexible as uh, as clay we need to be molded into anything that's possibly imaginable uh, and uh, the, this is the result of the of the changes that, uh, that have been happening since the 40s they have accelerated in the 60s but wait a second the 1960s uh, the cultural awakening has not been exclusive to the us they happen in germany in Japan, there, there was a rat brigade of terrorists. I'm not sure if I remember their, their name correctly. In Latin America, for example, Argentina, there have been guerrilla uprisings, guerrilla warfare, and so on. Uh, uh, the 60s came to Argentina a little later. In the, in the 1970s, the military had to take over with General Videla to impose a fascist regime and put a lid on the revolution. So you've got to wonder, though, why, uh, why ha has, the, has this uh, toxic phenomenon of individualism and globalization affected the U.S. so much more than it affected all the other countries where similar developments have taken place? What do you guys think? I think two things. The, the original class, the sort of southern gentry class, was destroyed after the Civil War because of the material conditions mm -hmm. under which that class could exist no longer existed. And then I think what happened to the Wasp class was analogous to Nietzsche's critique of the undermention. The people out of power decided to use shaming tactics to mm -hmm. subvert power from those who had it. But like Nietzsche criticized of those people, they have nothing to replace it with. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I, I think I think um, tying that all together then is this 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 desire to to profit because right we have corporate personhood in corporations and the corporate experiment was most successful in the United States and well, least successful mm -hmm. in, in Russia. Well, I, I, I think you're onto something in that sense. But I, I would also say that the corporate experiment has been the most successful in the U.S. in part because the U.S. still has fairly immature institutions. And the U.S. Uh, branched off from England that had a Protestant culture, which was sympathetic to commerce. But on the other hand, if you look at other countries that broke away from Spain, for example, the Spanish-speaking culture, they were influenced by the Catholic religion, which we discussed before. Uh, the disadvantage uh, of uh, Catholicism is that it's, uh, it imposes a rigid structure of power. So the corporate, ex corporate experiment did not quite work out very well in Mexico, Argentina, or any anywhere in South America for that matter. But they preserved their culture and identity. But America being a fairly new and an immature country that deviated from a Protestant culture, or emerged from a Protestant culture, seemingly could had to choose between the rise of uh, the, uh, of corporate individualism uh, and uh, the, the cultural foundation. It was only one or the other. And it seems that America had the unique privilege of being able to disavow their, their culture, leg culture and history in favor of radical individualism that has been an all-consuming possession lately. One last question. What are your thoughts on Yuri Bezmenov? Yuri Bezmenov. Well, to be completely honest with you, I don't know. I don't know if we can take him at face value. It just seems too convenient that he gave his interview right around when Ronald Reagan was running for president, and he denounced Walter Mondale as a benevolent tyrant like the Soviets. I suspect he may have been acting with a political agenda when he said that. But all in all, his point about a useful idiots. Uh, is spot on. Lenin and Stalin would, would have had no problem sending the transgender activists and the other Ken, Ken freaks to the gulag. Uh, though I am really somewhat skeptical that his narrative represents reality. Of course the KGB had plans to demoralize America. Of course they tried. Of course they planted seeds. But I don't know of the insanity that's happening in America now is it should be blaming the Soviets. I, I think the Soviets, if anything, took advantage of it and exploited it for their self-serving interests. It, it's, it originated in the US, not in Russia. Black Lives Matter is not, is not a prop up for the KGB. The, the, the Black Panthers were not created by the KGB. I, I seriously doubt that. Well, since we're nearing the end of the hour and it's about time to wrap up, uh, what would, do you have anything you'd like to leave us with, Alex? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll be simple and to the point. Read The Possessed by Dostoevsky. Do it now. If you don't want to read it, just go on YouTube. You'll find a, you'll, you, you'll find audiobooks for free. If you think it's too complicated for you, get 90 Minutes, Dostoevsky 90 Minutes by Paul Strother. And that's a wonderful book. And pay attention to how, to, to how Dostoevsky critiques the, the intellectual grandeur of the, the, the grandeur of intellectual delusions uh, of, the, of these deluded pseudo-intellectuals. That's one thing. The other thing I would recommend for our audience to do is to familiarize themselves with the basics of the philosophy of Edmund Burke. Well, you're not going to find a comprehensive uh, theory of how society should be, but one thing to keep in mind is that uh, traditions need to evolve gradually. Statues are not to be torn down. And uh, decisions are to be made on the smallest and the most local possible level. That is known as the thesis of subsidiarity. To give you a clear example, if Alabama is against gay marriage, and most people don't, don't want to see it happen, fine, let Alabama do it, let Alabama prohibit it. But if New Yorkers and San Franciscans are for it, let them do it. So, and uh, the other thing to learn from Edmund Burke is noblesse oblige, that there should not be an entertainer in charge of the country. 
I'm sorry, being in charge of the apprentice does not qualify somebody to run for president, not by a long shot. And the noblest oblige means that a person in a position of power has a moral obligation to, to provide for the least fortunate and the least and the least capable. So uh, to give you a case in point, there, are, there is no explosion in homelessness in the streets of Europe. And that's not a matter of economics. That's a matter of culture. And I, I, I would say once, uh, once you read Dostoevsky in conjunction with Burke, you will see the, the possession of BLM and Antifa in a completely different light. Uh, now, one part in thought uh, is Alexis de Tocqueville, a French aristocrat who visited the United States, uh, famously commented on how Russia and the U.S. were similar in the sense that they both had a lot of potential in the 19th century, while other countries uh, pretty much reached the, the, the end of the line, reached all of their potential, but, but they're incompatible. Tocqueville foresaw the Cold War 100 years before it happened, that the, uh, Russia is fundamentally authoritarian, the U.S. has libertarian tendencies, but Tocqueville's most uh, significant insight is that Americans believed in equality because they did not have a culture of aristocracy. Uh, they had a more egalitarian climate in the 90s. However, what Tocqueville feared the most is that with the rise of the Industrial Revolution, a new uh, aristocrat class will emerge, and America will have the worst of both worlds. On the one hand, they will have the wealth disparities, as there are in an aristocracy. And there will be class tensions, but on the other hand, the, the new American aristocrats will not have the education of noblesse oblige that their European peers have. And, and we've seen this trend explode in the 60s. The talk will not only foresaw the Cold War, he foresaw the age of degeneracy that we're living in now that has reached its culmination point with the possession that's currently in progress with this apex of the coronavirus, attack on statues and attack on anything civilized in the U.S. So there we go. Add Tocqueville's Democracy in America to your reading list. Listen to him on YouTube. Learn these fundamental ideas. They're classics for a reason. They will be banned at your university. Uh, maybe these books will be burned in 10 years. So get them and read them before it's too late. Well, thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you, Keith Preston. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast, signing off.